Please rise for our first hymn. Welcome to worship at St. James this evening. If you're watching online, we're uh, recording the Saturday night service. You all got past the police barricades. And uh, um, yeah, I had, you know what? I went out to talk to the policeman as I was uh, just getting ready for church. And um, so said, you know, if people want to come to church, let them through. And he says, I know, I met a lady from your church. Really nice lady, about this tall. She was struggling with uh, cancer. She lived on King Arthur. I went, Kathy. And I went, yeah. She said, she invited me to come to church. I really ought to come. Kathy, you know, Kathy, amazing Kathy. Anyway, we're here. Thanks for making it. There could still be people making it through. I hope they don't give up trying to get past the police barricades. Why don't we um, take a moment and, uh, and uh, say hello to each other and congratulate one another on making it to church. Yes. Uh, visitors and guests are here. Hello. Yes. Good. Good to see you. And good to have Carol Houston with us tonight again. Thank you, Carol. That was lovely. JSU Joy of Man's Desiring. That was the piece of music Carol, my, Carol walked into when we got married. So it was a lovely piece. Anyway, we're here to, um, to know and hail the power of Jesus and know his grace and um, have him touch our and reform and restore, restore and renew our hearts. God's here for all that. We invoke his presence and work in our midst now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. 
Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we've sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Would you please kneel to confess your sins? We pray, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. And let's praise the Lord. First reading is from 1 Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, we, are, we <clears throat> who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command uh, and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trump, the trumpet of God and the dead, will, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Right. 
according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, to you Lord. O Lord. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. <coughs> then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending you the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, praising God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you o, Christ. o Christ. Please join me now in the prayer of the day found in your bulletin. Almighty God, Please. that your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascended to his heavenly throne. And he said, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. Send us your Spirit. That we may believe. Send us your spirit. That we may fulfill Christ's mission for us. Send us your spirit. That our hearts already may be filled with the glory of heaven. Where we will also one day dwell. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen.
grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This is the last uh, sermon in this series uh, on Elijah tonight. This is the con sad. Yeah, sad. It's the longest sermon series I've ever preached. Nine parts. But anyway, here we go. Uh, in the uh, 2008 Beijing Olympics, the U.S. women's 4x100 relay team was so favored to win that it wasn't a matter of whether they would win, but by how much. However, one interesting thing about a relay is that sometimes you can be the fastest team, but if you don't hand off that baton well, you could easily lose. And in the semi-final race, that's exactly what happened. They dropped the baton and lost. Never even got to the finals. Sadly, the same thing happened to the US men's relay team. The transfer of the baton, it matters. And that is a picture I want us to have as tonight we see the leadership of the Old Testament prophets transition from the senior veteran to his younger protege. As we see Elijah handing the baton of the prophetic office to his student and friend, Elisha. <clears throat> In the first six verses of uh, the readings we're going to have tonight, we get a real sense that Elisha isn't just doing a job. He, he, he is not a, uh, he's not take it or leave it about his discipleship to Elijah. He is devoted. And Rosemary, would you please read to us, yes. it's printed in the bulletin, the first um, section of the reading from 2 Kings chapter 2. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Elisha did not forgo his opportunity to be mentored by an experienced pastor. He followed Elijah and learned everything he could from him. Some uh, commentators estimate that they were together in an apprentice relationship for uh, 10 years or even more. That's a long time to grow close to someone and be influenced by them. But now, I mean, you talk about a transition. In verse 3, we find out that everybody who is in the know has had it revealed to them that God was going to take Elijah from the earth on that day, the day we're reading about in the scriptures. Uh, Elijah apparently wanted this to be a private moment between him and the Lord. But Elisha was so loyal, loyal, there's no way he would leave him. So three times they had this back and forth where Elijah uh, told him to stay put, but Elisha swore an oath with a little oath formula as the Lord lives and all that kind of thing, uh, swearing an oath that he's going to stay with him. Let's pause right there for a moment. Forget that these guys are prophets and they have a spirituality and they experience things that we aren't used to. And forget the odd sounding formality of their oaths and stuff. Just look for a moment at these two men who encouraged one another. There's a scene in the movie The Fellowship of the Ring when Frodo leaves the main group, the fellowship, um, after a chaotic battle with orcs and tries to go to Mordor by himself. He even tries to ditch his best friend and protector, Sam, 
because he's trying to spare him, anticipating that his path will involve pain and difficulty. So Frodo is rowing a boat from the shore when Sam runs up and Frodo says, go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone. Of course you are. And I'm coming with you, <laughs> says Sam. And then Sam starts swimming for the boat. However, he can't swim. So he starts to go down and drown. But Frodo pulls him into the boat. And Sam says, I made a promise, Mr. Frodo, a promise. Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee. And I don't mean to. Then they embrace. Together they start rowing. Friendships like that are powerful. And powerful good can happen because of them. Institutions, on the other hand. I'm not anti-institution. I'm pro-institution. Good, solid institutions. But they're vulnerable to attack from evil. And their effectiveness can be sidetracked or neutralized by a skillful enemy. But a devoted friendship is almost impossible to stop. Jesus is devoted to you like that. When you respond to him with like devotion, loving the Lord with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength, the good that is then set loose is something no enemy can stop or even quash. But back to our text. Elijah makes stops at Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. What was he doing? If he knew God wanted him to get to the Jordan River, he was saying his last goodbyes. To who? Well, evidently, there were schools of prophets called the Sons of the Prophets, located in Gilgal, Bethel, and Jericho. These were the early seminaries where young men were trained to undertake the sacred calling and disciplined lifestyle of a prophet, of a man of God. One reason for Elijah's unusual route to the Jordan was his desire to meet one last time with these young prophets in training and offer final words of encouragement to those who would carry the torch of truth after his departure. And I think it's interesting and kind of funny what happens. I mean, a school of prophets. You know, these guys are in tune with the mysterious things, the spirit of God. It's, it's not like you know regular old community college. At each stop, the young prophets want to make sure that Elisha knows what God has told them, that God is going to take Elijah that day. Elisha says, yeah, I know, clam up. But we should see these, these groups of prophets, these schools, that they were there to support both of these men and also to carry on the ministry. Now, do we have anything like this today? Well, yes. You know, uh, Jesus had disciples, not just one. Uh, he had a lot uh, that he passed the baton of ministry to. The 12, obviously, but also uh, 70 others we read about, both men and women. And the baton of kingdom ministry has been passed down continually from one believer to another, from the more experienced to the less, ever since an unbroken relay race down to the present day. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, the apostle lays it out. He writes, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you see it there? Paul has received teaching and ministry from Jesus. He's passed it on to people there in the church who he now tells on to pass to others who will then be able to pass it on, and on and on it goes. How does that look today? Well, our church body has seminaries for the training of pastors, beautiful big schools in St. Louis and Fort Wayne, but it's not just there. Right here, our congregation has a path for raising people up in ministry, spirit-filled ministry. You all got a diagram that looks like this. Have a look at this thing. I've, uh, I've used uh, uh, the idea that, that, you know, that, that's supposed to be like a floor plan of a house, you see, a house. And uh, the idea of here is, is moving, th progressing through a house. You know, as you get to know people and you go to their house, 
at first there's um you go from I didn't know them at all to uh, maybe a, a friendly conversation at the front door I'm getting to know you talking at the front door nice chat neighbors you might talk there for some time if things go on you um, get to know them better you're in the living room it could be a long long time even a party in the living room uh, you're getting to know them as you get to know them as you grow in the, in the relationship even more you end up in the kitchen where you're not just being entertained, you're actually helping to cook and all that kind of stuff. You're like family now. Okay? You're, you're part of the work. I, I've used that kind of dynamic to uh, describe how things progress here at our church. Now, we have a getting started. Uh, we have a class called Getting Started. Um, I call that the front door. It's five sessions. It's about what we believe. People take that class and they're really changed by it. Um, following that, in the living room, I've, I've, I've drawn the, the Alpha Course which is a 10 sessions, and they include dinner, you know what I mean? You're really getting to know people now. And it's the, the whys and hows of life and God. Beyond that, after Alpha, Alpha was followed by Beta. A Beta group goes for five months, and here you're learning um, to actually do and put into practice, not just hear about, you don't just hear about how, reading the Bible and hear about prayer and hear about how God guides us and hear about how to uh, tell somebody else about Jesus, which is all stuff that happens in the Alpha course. You're actually doing it with others. You're putting it into practice. You're, uh, and that's the, the beta group. And, and following that, you head out the door there to on mission with the Lord Jesus. There's a, there's a progression there. There's a progression. By the way, um, I wish that if you've never taken the Getting Started class, I wish you all would get started with the Getting Started class. You say, well, I've been a member here for years. Hey, Maria Honnold and, um, and Pam Orenstein took the last class. And they went, just because... And they loved it. I'm going to get them out here someday soon, and they're going to tell you, hey, you should all do this. We did it, um, even though they've been members here for years. But anyway, um, making people progressing in, in school, the school of the Spirit here at St. James. But let's keep reading from 2 Kings chapter 2 for what happens next. Rosemary, would you read the next section there from the Bible? Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other, till the two of them could, cross, could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, and what I shall do for you before I am taken, oh, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Elijah parts the Jordan River with his rolled up cloak. And the two men walk over on dry ground. Now, what does that remind you of? Exactly. Aunt Carol, you turn to the class. God's parting of the Red Sea under Moses. And by the way, it also, if you really know your Bible, it also uh, reminds you of God's earlier parting of that same Jordan River about 200 years before under Joshua's leadership. Now, I know, modern Christians are often a bit uneasy hearing and reading these things. You know, about the power of God doing strange wonders like this. What to make of it? Well, I'm afraid the Bible indeed does challenge rational, secular people who frankly think like we do um, with realities that are supra-rational does. The Bible says it's not all rationality and science. There's a, other things going on. Although when science, even our best rational science, tells us that the vast universe began from literally nothing, well, right there we're staring in the face of a supra-rational reality, the Big Bang. And by the way, the Webb telescope hasn't taken anything away from that. You know, how can you get everything, even time and space, from nothing? The whole thing points to the Creator God 
And the Bible merely records how this all-powerful, supra-rational God makes a point of interacting with the human race, sometimes with wonders like the ones we read about here. And this isn't the last time. Okay, so Elijah gives Elisha a chance to ask anything of him. So interesting what makes these guys tick. Elisha asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Now what does that mean? Is Elisha asking to be twice as great as Elijah? No. A double portion is the standard phraseology from that time for an eldest son's share of his father's estate. It signified legally who was the eldest son and so also who would be taking responsibility for the whole family and the family's land after dad dies. So with Elisha, the phrase means that he's asking for the inner resources to be Father Elijah's successor. It's not some material or financial resources he needs to carry on the mission to Israel. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Is Elisha asking for too much here? Should he have been more modest? No, the exact opposite. He was admitting, I need God to empower, gift, and guide me for this task because I cannot do it without him. It would actually have been arrogant of Elisha to tell Elijah, hey, I'm good, I'm ready, go ahead and die. I'll do a great job without you, I don't need anything. No, Elisha knows that nothing significant is going to happen without the mysterious and powerful Spirit of God coming to him and through him. Similarly, Jesus tells his disciples at the end of Luke in the reading we had tonight, don't attempt anything. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, Elijah was not the Lord Jesus and was not sure if Elisha's request could be met because unlike Jesus, the Holy Spirit was not Elijah's to give out. But he reckoned that if God allowed Elisha to witness his departure, that it must be meant to happen. And the opposite was true. If Elisha was not able to perceive what happened in the spirit world when Elijah was taken away in a whirlwind, then maybe God wasn't gifting him to be a prophet. In the next five verses, what Elisha then sees when Elijah goes, very unexpected. If you would please, Ruth Marie. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces, and he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the, so, to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and they bowed to the ground before him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. That's the song that usually comes to mind with this story. Though, if you read the text carefully, it doesn't say that Elijah actually got into a chariot. Verse 11 says that what the chariots and horses did was separate the two men. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind. I mean, it's still... Wow, the, the, the chariots and horses were the angelic army that unseen by the majority of people had been protecting Israel. We don't even think this way, but it's true. And Elijah, who's not an angel, but a man of God, 
he had been serving with that army. And Elisha, the disciple of the great prophet, is enabled, spiritually gifted, to witness all this. And the baton of prophetic leadership is passed to him. Immediately, confirmatory signs and wonders, the parting of the river again, start to happen through him, as they had with his mentor. I'd encourage you to read about Elisha's life in the next 11 chapters of 2 Kings, even though I am not going to be preaching through it. Elijah's going bodily to heaven. Bodily to heaven. It's mind-boggling. It may stretch your understanding of the connection between heaven and earth. We think there's like a solid wall between them. No such thing. Okay? But there's a similar event. Much as you may you say, this is blowing my transistors. But you know what? There's a similar event that you confess nearly every, you confess in faith nearly every week. What? Jesus' ascension to heaven. And it's clearly foreshadowed here in Elijah's departure. In Luke 24, after Jesus' resurrection, we read, Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Of course, Jesus had died once, but he defeated death and rose fully back to life. He did not and will never die a second time. All the other people who were raised in the Bible, Lazarus, for example, or the widow of Nain's son, um, they eventually died a second time, poor things. But like Elijah, Jesus was carried up into heaven. He returned to the control room of the universe, or as the Apostles' Creed states it, was seated at the right hand of the Father. He sat down because he'd done his work. He had lived a perfect life of obedience as a human being. He had taught the, word, he taught the world the ways of God's kingdom. He had healed whom he was supposed to heal and trained whom he was supposed to train. Then he endured a sacrificial death on the cross, giving his life as a substitute for sinners, taking their punishment for them. For you, he took your punishment, your sins. God then raised him from the dead, and 40 days later, brought him up into heaven. That was transition time. Time for Christ's people to receive his baton and carry on the race. The people Jesus had trained to do ministry were standing there when he ascended. He was handing everything over now to his followers. Before Jesus ascended, he promised that he would send the Spirit. He called them the promise of my Father to be with them, to help them accomplish their tasks in ministry. In John 14, verse 16, Jesus had said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. He dwells with you and will be in you. Also, John 14, verse 12, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. In 1945, when Harry Truman was the vice president under Franklin D. Roosevelt, he was summoned to the White House, where he learned that the president had died. He asked Mrs. Roosevelt if there was anything he could do for her. But she replied, is there anything we can do for you? You're the one who's in trouble now. The presidency was now his. He had, in, he had inherited it upon Roosevelt's death and would now have a lot of difficult work to do. That was Elisha's situation after Elijah's departure. That was the disciple's situation after Jesus' departure. And it gives us a picture of how we should feel about our own lives. Not that we're the president, but that we are the ones doing the work of representing, of representing God on earth, or at least on our part of the earth. We do it in the non-earthly power, a power not from earth. We do it in power, but a power that doesn't come from here, that he gives us. 
guided by his spirit, mightily encouraged by being united to Christ, communing with and upheld in the glorious Lord Jesus. We're running our leg of the race. We were handed the baton by believers who came before us, who took it from the generation before them, all the way back to Jesus, handing it to his disciples. You can see the relay going on right here in this church. The baton passing and the spirit-filled running. Women and men who a few short years ago were attending their first getting started class or their first dinner in the Alpha Course are now actually leading these things. Leading others to know the Savior and showing others how to do what they've learned to do. The Holy Spirit is moving in this congregation. And to use the Old Testament term from tonight, there's a growing school of prophets here. Others have come to the Alpha Course. Actually, I mean to say, they've gone through the whole St. James house, as per that diagram, from the front door to the kitchen. And then they've gone into caregiving ministry, joining with Jesus in bringing hope and healing to others, visiting in homes and hospitals, writing cards, ministering in prayer, etc. It's actually it's very exciting what people are doing. And it's, it's going on. Three questions here at the end to ask yourself. One, have I grabbed the baton? And am I running with it in step with the Spirit? Two, where am I in that St. James house? Am I at the front door? Am I walking up to the front door? I'm in the living room, the kitchen. Where am I? Three, where am I going next? Jesus calls me to follow him. My church has a way to facilitate that. So what am I doing with that? Where am I going? Our awesome Lord ascended and has transitioned the good work and given the Holy Spirit to us. He held out the baton personally to you in your baptism. Jesus put that baton in your hand. In these coming weeks and months then, what will you do? Admire the baton? Look at the baton? Or will you run with it? Jesus is waiting for your answer. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Would you please rise? And let's together confess the faith in our hearts using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For the whole church of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs, let us bow our heads together and let us pray. Heavenly Father, through the humiliation of your Son, you have called us to a place at your heavenly table. Teach us to treasure this place of honor and to turn away from the foolish honors of this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of justice, you exalt the humble and humble the proud in your own appointed time. We commend to you all those who govern the countries of our world. Grant them the desire to govern as though serving and give them wisdom and courage to know what is right and to follow it. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Merciful God, you call on us to practice brotherly love 
to show hospitality to strangers and to remember all those in need. We come to you confident that you will not leave us nor forsake us, but will grant us all that we need for this body and life. Bestow on us the full riches of your grace for all the situations and circumstances in which your people dwell. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Beautiful Savior, we lift up to you all our Atlantic District service organizations, including all those who serve in such organizations in St. James Lutheran Church. We pray for them as they counsel, heal, serve, love, and support those who need their particular expertise. May they see people helped and built up in the joy of the Lord and in their daily ministry, recognize your hand of provision. May they be guided by the Holy Spirit in all they do. And in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. O Lord, grant peace and healing according to your will to the sick, the suffering, those troubling in mind, those suffering depression, and those with chronic illness and pain, including Loretta Sauer, who was undergoing medical procedures, Stu Mead, friend of the Sandtops, who was now being treated for cancer once again, Jean Aram, who was recovering from a stroke at home, Rich Bacher, who underwent knee replacement surgery, Laura Collin, who's waiting to hear whether she requires additional cancer treatment, and Kyle Brower's family as they mourn the loss of Kyle's aunt. And those we now name before you, aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, remembering that here we have no abiding city, but that heaven is our home. Give us your aid that we may be true faith and godly life prepare for the coming of our Savior, multiplying your mercy by loving our neighbor in need and loving you with all our body, soul, strength, and will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our, we return thanks by the offering to our generous and gracious God. Um, we may put our offering in the plate of the narthex, or we can give electronically, or use that QR code. But um, let's do that. And, let God know um, we thank him and love him. And let's join together also in the offertory prayer. Heavenly Father, you have made an investment in each of us. All we have is on loan from you. Accept our thanks. Along with these gifts, tiny returns on your investment. And lead us to lives of love and service. Then we will be rich toward you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I made a remark how we think, often think heaven is way, 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 you know, a galaxy far, far away and far from the earth. Uh, you know, this, even this meal that Jesus has given us just explodes that. Christ, the king of heaven, <laughs> really present here. Heaven is touching earth, touching you. It's like heaven come down and, uh, and taking us up into him. It's, it's an amazing thing. Um, and it's, well, even if our understanding can't get around it, we can still believe it because Christ said it, he who rose from the dead. Then let's, let's let the graces of heaven, Christ's body and blood with us, uh, feed us now in this meal as we come to him. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, 
Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who ascended above the heavens and sitting at your right hand, poured out the promised Holy Spirit on his disciples. At this the whole earth rejoices with exceeding joy. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and their children from the tree of life. Yet, in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you've prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way also after supper he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying take and drink this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. We have the Agnes Day. <laughs>
peace be with you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Christ our Lord. Peace be with you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Jesus Christ, our Lord, given for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Jesus, given in love for you. Peace be with you. Take and eat. This is the true body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. The very body of our Savior Jesus given for you. rise. And we'll sing together the Nuns de Betis.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for some announcements. I, did, 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 did the fire department have their big parade? I, I was, was expecting at five. I, I was expecting noise and confusion and interruption. I didn't well, really have. I heard a little bit of a cannonball. Going okay. <laughs> Orphan grain train. There's a train. Yep. Yeah. October second, after the ten a.m. service, you're invited to help back pack twenty thousand meals for kids against hunger. Pizza lunch will be available to start the activity, so come on down to the parish hall after the 10 a.m. service and lend a hand. It'll be around 11.30ish, 12ish that they'll start. Super, the pot collection is September coming up. In fact, I'm supposed to hold a pot or whatever out there. During the September services, Outreach and MAD members will be ringing a soup pot after services. Your loose and quiet change. Quiet change, quiet. that's nice. Isn't that good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. <laughs> will be so appreciated. Yep, this money will be used to pay for the 20,000 meals we will pack on October 2nd. I don't know if anybody remembers when we actually measured the grain. Oh, we're doing all that. We're going to do we're gonna, it again. We're going to measure it all, all in the bag. Oh, good. It wouldn't be the same. And, and you know, the, the, the reason for, you know, the orphan grandchildren, they said, well, you pack it all up and, and we'll send a truck and stuff. And, and, um, and uh, it costs us some money to send trucks and stuff. But, but when we first started doing this, we said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We'll, we'll pay for the truck, too. Like, like, you know what I mean? You're, we we want to help you out. So that's, we're raising money so that it won't cost them anything. We'll right. pack the meals and pay for the truck right. and pay for the transportation and everything. That's what we're doing that's here. the object. Yeah. Right. It was good. I thought it was just fantastic. Anyway, the St. James Street Fair uh, is October 2nd, 11 a.m. to 5, and we will have a booth that will be set up, and Loretta, uh, Loretta and Jim Sauer are looking for volunteers to help with greeting people, telling them all about the different things we've available at our church, like preschool, Sunday school, VBS, grief share, cancer support group, worship service times, and you know the rest. I'm sure Jim and Loretta will have a little list for anybody who, uh, in case it slips your mind, all the stuff that we do mm. and enjoy doing for the Lord. Uh, let's see. Uh, St. James Lutheran Church has many events and classes planned for this uh, fall. You might have gotten that on your cell phone. Please see the bulletin for the date scheduled for the following classes. Parenting in a Changing World, dinner in three sessions discussing topics affecting our families, such as social media, bullying, addiction, and more. The Mom's Parenting Course, a 10-week course held on Monday evenings. Getting Started Class, a two-session class teaching the basics of the Lutheran faith as an initial step towards membership in St. James Lutheran Church, and confirmation orientation meeting for seventh and eighth graders and their parents. Sunday school kickoff, Sunday, September 11th at the, the 10 a.m. service, followed by the glorious church picnic at Norway Hall. The children will come to service with their parents or guardians and be dismissed to the parish hall. If you don't know what to bring to the picnic, Bean salad. It's always the right thing to bring. That's Bean true. Salad. The last time we had about 10. <laughs> right. They will be dismissed to the parish hall with their Sunday school teachers. More information, of course, will follow. Buy a Bible for a preschooler. We're looking to present 100 Bibles to our incoming preschool. I know some of you have done that before. That was, a, that was really a thrill. Anyway, each Bible costs $10. Please see the bulletin for more details and continue to have a blessed Saturday and Sunday tomorrow. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Please rise and we'll sing our final hymn. 